whenever you sign up for some type of vertical program, a lot of times you're working with percentages, mm -hmm. right? Um, but we've been working with our percentages, but for me, it's, it, it's kind of, it was tough for me to find what I thought my one rep max was. So do you have any advice on, on how someone like me would find that someone who thinks they're athletic, they think they have a very solid foundation, but all of a sudden the mobility isn't quite there. And now that changes your one rep max idea. So how do you suggest finding that? Welcome to Better at Beach podcast show recording YouTube episode. My name is Mark Burrick and this is my co-host Brandon Joyner. We're both high level competitive beach volleyball players and coaches and we are bringing you as much beach volleyball knowledge as you can handle every week. Today we are going to talk about everything vertical jump. There are a lot of mysteries, a lot of fallacies out there, myths, and what we want to do is sort of dispel all the myths, give you good sound biomechanics, and really easy ways uh, to get your workouts geared towards jumping higher. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been fun, and I'm, I'm excited for today's episode mainly because um, I think I've kind of always knowing your background in body mechanics and sports science and all that stuff. I've kind of used you over the years as like my own personal trainer, <laughs> uh, but I've uh, I still have some questions, especially now that I'm getting older and I'm trying to take care of my body a little bit more. My mentality's changed a little bit. So yeah, I, I think today I'm going to let you do a decent amount of the talking. I'll, I'll join in when I can, but I, I'm going to try to just ask you some questions that I've either thought of along the road um, or that I currently still have because mm. uh, we're currently starting, well, not really starting, but doing our big final push to get strong for the season. Um, Mark and I have been doing our 60 day max vertical program, which has been amazing so far. My body already feels 10 times stronger, but I'm also, I'm getting a lot of feedback from you every time we work out and I'm asking questions as well that I don't think I asked when I was 18, 19, 20, 21 <laughs> years old, when I was getting strong for the sport of beach volleyball or for the sport of volleyball in general. So, uh, sure. yeah, I'm excited to kind of learn and, and just be here to kind of facilitate some questions that I think some people might ask. Cool. Uh, it should be fun. Um, a little bit about my education history. I went to school for exercise science. I, for, for whatever you want to say about it, when I decided to go to college, it, I, I, college was like an automatic, but I was going to play sports. Like that was what I did and the school was on the side. I know that's not the right way to think about it. Uh, I wish I'd taken a few more finance accounting business courses, but the knowledge that I got in college from exercise science, it was so easy to me because what you're learning in the classroom you're then immediately applying as an athlete in your sport. So everything that I learned in a textbook, like I had almost double the hours of theory session because I was applying it in the gym. I was applying it on the court. So it became for me a really easy topic to learn. And I guess just because I was surrounded by it, not just in classroom, but also in, in practice. So I did that. I got a minor in nutrition, a minor in psych, and I ended up uh, being a personal trainer or performance trainer. And I got a number of certifications between my certified strength and conditioning specialist, performance enhancement specialist, and other personal training certifications. So I, I've learned a lot. I've studied along the way. And I hope we can, uh, again, dispel some of the myths about vertical jump and really just give people an easy path to jumping higher in their approach, uh, jumping higher from a standstill, and probably how they should work out in order to increase it. I like it. And so for me, I, I'm just because I know you're going to be doing a decent amount of talking, a little bit of background for me is I, I was actually, and we kind of, we talked about this the other day. Um, I think it was Sunday when we were watching football. I was a kid in, in high school that did not work out really at all. Uh, I, I remember my 18th year, we had to go to a, a gym that was U-turn. It was five minutes from our practice, practice facility, and we had to do like a 30-minute workout. And that was the existence of my workout repertoire 
before I got to college. For me, one of the big things that I found that helped my vertical is that, so when I got into college, I think I was touching around like 10, 10, so 10 mm -hmm. feet, 10 inches, uh, which isn't bad by any means. I, I think that that's pretty, a pretty solid number for a freshman coming into college. But by the time that I graduated college, I was touching like 11.5, 11, 11.6. 11, and I think for me, one of the big, one of the big reasons that my vertical was able to increase so much was mainly just doing it over and over again. You know, I, I think when I was a, when I was a junior or when I was playing in juniors volleyball, I was limited to three practices a week, two hours of practice. That was it for me. When I went home, I wasn't working out and gaining gaining inches on my vertical, but just putting myself into a position where I was max jumping every single time that I had a chance in practice uh, at workouts, and I saw my vertical rise a lot. So especially in, if you're a parent or if you're a younger kid that doesn't pos doesn't have the ability to train in the sand year round, I always tell people it's okay to play indoor. Uh, mainly because it's going to give your body the experience it needs to feel those jump repetitions time after time. Mm -hmm. um, so without talking anything about science, my contribution to this episode of the podcast is just <laughs> jump as much as you can. <laughs> Obviously, there's technique behind it that we're going to discuss, but um, I honestly think that that was, that was probably... 60 70 percent of my vertical growth in college was just the fact that I was doing it every single day and I didn't take reps off I I tried to jump as high as I possibly could and practice every single time um, luckily for me I was a setter so I didn't have to think about jumping and hitting too much but uh, when I was blocking when I was when I was jump setting I, I even tried to reach that max so um, I think if you are if you're looking for a way to increase your vertical if you're in those cold states where getting outside or doing anything else is is not an option indoor is definitely going to help you especially if you're thinking about increasing your vertical 100 percent. you know the the nervous system builds pathways and that's kind of what people forget is that your body eventually finds faster routes for the electrical impulses to go through from your brain to your muscles and to be able to do any task. So whatever task you do with your body every day, you are going to get better, faster, more efficient, and it's going to cost you less energy because your body just gets better at it. So if, like you said, you just keep jumping, that's going to be good for you. And I thought you said something else that was really important uh, because setters don't often get to do this a lot. Setters do jump potentially more than anybody on the court for indoor, uh, but they end up hopping a lot. So setters kind of have a maybe a 50, 60% jump instead of a max jump, and your body will get good at that. But just remember, everybody, that if you practice at 50% or if you go at 50% speed, your body gets very good at finding that zone that comfortable zone so when you do jump like brandon said find a way to teach your body how to max out on its speed and on its height and most people don't realize that when you go up for a spike it's usually not a 100 percent jump it's not a max effort so there does have to be focus in your training routine in your rituals your workouts your practices where you say I am attempting to jump as high and as fast as possible. And we're going to get into that during the, uh, the, the workout portion here, but let's talk about some pillars of workout. There's somebody else who has a, a pretty good vertical jump program. Well, pretty good. I trust his vertical jump program because of what I see him post on Instagram. Um, and that's Reed Hall, who's got an excellent vertical jump program and a similar history to what I have uh, with a background in volleyball and vertical jump. And he said that the first thing that anybody should be focused on is assessment. If you're not looking at yourself, looking at your weaknesses, your imbalances, it's very difficult for you to tell yourself to do a max effort anything. Should you be throwing weight on your back before you can comfortably squat with your butt under your knees? 
It's not a great idea if you don't have full mobility. So a lot of what we have to do first is take some movement assessments. And I know that at home, this isn't one of those easy tips where you can say, uh, well, how do I know when I'm mobile enough? You have to be comfortable getting your hip crease under your knee crease. And if you can't do that without a straight back, a straight low back, you're really not ready to start putting weight onto those squats. And if you do, I mean, we're talking about like put an empty bar on it so that you're not adding tons of weight, but you have to have that mobility. And, you know, I talk about my, my wife a lot on the show and she was a gymnast. And so her ability to maintain a straight spine and a sturdy core through any movement is insane. She does it naturally, but you know, I could look at my brother who's a fireman, obviously in great shape, can literally carry people out of buildings, but I get more worried about him because when he tries to go down for just a body weight squat, all the, like his low back starts curling, everything just kind of rounds out. And so to add weight on top of an immobile body is dangerous. It's dangerous for the body. So the first thing that everybody needs to do is assess their movement. Can you get your hip crease under your knee crease while looking in a mirror or putting a phone on the side of you and saying, does my low back stay straight or does it, we call it a butt wink, or does it just curl out at the very end? And if it is curling out, if you can't get that depth, you have to embrace a mobility program. And you know, from our, our training together, we go through a ton of mobility before we do anything with weights. Everything's about getting deep, getting more range, and finding out what's tight. Yeah, and it's especially with the uh, the program that we're doing. One of the, I've said it I've said it while we've been working out, but one of the things that has stuck with me that our strength trainer said in college a lot was, "Don't get blinded by weight." And now that I'm an adult, I I agree with that <laughs> completely. But in the college atmosphere, when you have 20 19 to 23 year old guys that are in a weight room it was so hard to not get blinded by weight you know it's mm -hmm. it, we even had we called it bench one bench two bench squat one squat two and it it was based on strength and it was if you're not a competitor then you you were you were trying to get up to that top bench so for me when I, now that we're back and we're and we're doing the strength, it's, it has been frustrating for me because I feel strong, um, and, and mostly just because I'm a 33 year old male that has been lifting for over 10 years now. Mm -hmm. And when I go to do a squat, and I think I should be close to 200 pounds, I'm still living in that low 100 range because I'm still focusing on my mobility. And that's one of the things that has held me, held me back a lot in the sport of beach volleyball too, whether it's injury or just strength in these low positions that I, I haven't had in the past. Um, but it, it really has been great uh, working with you specifically the last couple of weeks because not only do I have another set of eyes asking me what I felt or I remember yes, it might have been Monday. I you were taught we were talking about holding breath and pushing out my stomach and and trying to find and find that tension. And I was wearing like a loose shirt, and you were like, "That was the one." And I was like, "I don't even know how you saw that." Um, <laughs> and so it it but it did feel like a better rep. Um, and 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 it's just hard because I think a lot of the times when we as athletes put ourselves on this plan to become stronger and mobility is an issue. What do you think is the best way to tackle that? I know, I know you said obviously starting with lower weight, but does it have to do with your warm up? Does it have to do with uh, the, the lifts that you're doing? Like when and how should you be concentrating on that? Yeah. You know, setting that base. So any good program needs to start with this mobility and then needs to slowly increase that weight. And if you don't feel like you can do perfect technique under a light weight, then there's no way you should be moving up until you do that. Because at, then you're going to think that you're stronger, but you're going to be stronger in a limited range, in a very limited range. And when you have that limited range and then the edge, 
the edge of your mobility is weak or unstable, that is when an injury is going to happen. And that's mm -hmm. when instead of it progressively getting stronger, all of a sudden you lose eight weeks, you know, or you lose two weeks because you, you threw out your back or something popped. Right. And that's so much worse than just going slower because going slower, you always keep playing. You never lose time. Right. But as soon as you overreach because you have bad technique or you didn't build your mobility properly, now you lose time in the weight room and you lose time on the court. Mm -hmm. And that's the most detrimental thing. Consistency is everything. It's absolutely everything. So for everybody who's kind of looking for other signs of, of how do we do that, you go through, you can look up online anywhere, really, a dynamic range of motion series. Uh, you can look to our blog, betteratbeach.com, and just search the keyword warm up under betteratbeach.com forward slash blog. And we give you a bunch of ideas. And if you really want to get into the nitty gritty and you want a full mobility program, well, then you can sign up for our seven day foundations program, betterbeach.com forward slash foundations, or you just hop right into the 60 day max vertical jump. And we take you through the first two weeks of extremely lightweight and getting that mobility up. It's funny to know that the majority of the increase for a lot of people when they come into our program, it's usually like three to four inches of vertical leap or even broad jump within the first four or five weeks. And people are like, whoa, what are you doing? Like, what's the secret? That's crazy that I saw that this many results. And all it is is opening your body's pathways because a lot of our athletes come to us from having no program with no <laughs> consistency. Mm -hmm. And then it's, hey, if you teach your body how to do this three or four times a week and you're getting into better ranges, you're going to be able to jump higher automatically. And then at the end of the program, last five to six weeks, that's when we really start adding a bunch of actual strength instead of kind of nerve strength. And nerve strength will play a huge role in your in your early stages of increase in vertical leap. I like that. And so one of the things, and I'm sorry if I'm jumping ahead, but it's just a question I have. Whenever you sign up for some type of vertical program, a lot of times you're working with percentages, mm -hmm. right? Um, but we've been working with our percentages. But for me, it's it, it's kind of it was tough for me to find what I thought my one rep max was. So do you have any advice on on how someone like me? would find that someone who thinks they're athletic, they think they have a very solid foundation, but all of a sudden the mobility isn't quite there. And now that changes your one rep max idea. So how do you suggest finding that without um, actually doing it? Because I, I, to be honest, I don't, I wouldn't feel safe doing one yeah. rep max. It's an excellent point to say that it, why would I attempt to work at a percentage uh, and lift as heavy as I can when I know that I might not be in a good range. So here's how you start finding your one rep max. I want, you can put a, a bar on your back or you can go body weight, right? And if you don't know how deep is deep enough, that's okay. Find something, a low bench, a chair is probably a little bit too high, maybe a medicine ball that you can sit on so that your butt definitely gets under your knees. Right. And if you look sideways at the point where it's where it stops, where your uh, your low back starts to curve, your mobility cannot get you deeper than that. Right. So that's the one thing you shouldn't go deeper than that until you've increase that range. Now it's okay for your body to go that deep because that means that your spine is still straight. You're still holding yourself kind of sturdy and that's your limit. Whatever height that is, that's the going to be your limit. And you say, okay, this is my one rep max basically at this depth. And if you can do that depth safely, then we're going to do that while increasing a range or it's okay to do that while increasing your range because you can increase strength and range at the same time but there has to be focus on it like once you lose that edge so if you start let's say that i can put 135 on my back and i can sit on my 12 pound medicine ball i could get my butt that low now if i put 155 on my back and all of a sudden when i'm that low like my i see my low back is starting to curl out or I'm not comfortable getting that low with that weight, 
I cannot increase that weight. <laughs> there is absolutely no way. That's the line that I need to be working at. And if you go ahead and you can Google this, we also have this, we give it to our players in the 60 day max vertical program, but there is a one rep max percentage chart that everybody should know that you have a percentage of your one rep maximum that is going to coordinate with reps and sets, the number of reps and sets that you do. And that's how you can uh, judge what you're telling your body to do. For example, when you're working at like 65 to 75% of your one rep maximum, usually you're doing somewhere between 10 and 15 repetitions, okay, in that range. But when you're doing 10 to 15 repetitions, you're probably doing anywhere from two to four sets. And what you're working on at that point is hypertrophy. In other words, growing your muscles, making them bigger. Bigger muscles don't always mean fast muscles. That doesn't mean that you can jump higher, right? But it will shape them. And when you increase the, the, the size of the muscle fibers, then you have more potential to develop actual strength and actual speed. So to, to go back to the, the title, just quick fixes, mm -hmm. find a obstacle so that the, your butt is underneath your hips. And if you can keep it straight that long, good, then that's where you can, that's your comfortable range of operation where you're not going to get hurt. Of course, we do want to be able to get your thighs to be touching your calves, right? That's like full depth, full athleticism. If you can't get your thighs to touch your calves, then you know, we're not really getting as deep as we can. And so this whole, like everybody reaching their butt back and pushing their butt back, which makes the, the top of their shoulders fall forward while there's weight on it. That, that was a decent, it's a decent cue for some athletes, but it's not a great cue for a lot. Instead, a slight starting, starting the movement by pushing your hips back and then dropping straight down is a better cue for people to have. But if people keep reaching their butts backwards while they're doing squats, they're going to continue to get less range of motion and they're going to put a hell of a strain on their low back because you're holding that all up now with your low back. Yeah, I, I like that. I don't think I've ever heard anybody say that, you know, and I, I appreciate you going into that depth because a lot of us, we have the, an idea of how to work out, especially if, if we consider ourselves to be an athlete. Um, but giving yourself a mental picture of what that needs to look like and then kind of erasing your history of lifting and realizing that, okay, it's the movement that needs to be in control. doesn't matter if you can squat 225 and that's your max one rep max. If you look like crap, mm -hmm. um, you need to be okay. Think about perfect movement with the amount of weight that you feel comfortable with. And it's so, it's so hard to do. <laughs> it's so hard to take those, uh, cause you feel like you're taking steps backwards, you know, but, um, the one thing that I've, I've realized, especially these last couple of weeks is that it's just the, the, um, getting the mobility is almost, if not more important than building up the strength, the strength, mm -hmm. the strength will come, but getting used to finding yourselves in those low positions and still having strength has been incredible for me. I like, I, I already feel a lot better and stronger even while I'm playing. So it's, uh, it's pretty good. You know, it's if people would build houses the way that, that they lifted, it would be a terrifying situation. Mm -hmm. Because <laughs> can can you nail two pieces of wood so that they stand 10 feet tall? You know, two, like five pieces of wood. Can you nail them so that they stand 10 feet tall? Sure, you can. Are you going to put one nail in there? Like, no it's going to be completely unstable. And then are you going to start building a structure on top of that? No, because your whole house is going to fall down as soon as like a slight gust of wind comes along. Mm -hmm. So instead build that huge foundation and be proud of how much weight can be on that strong foundation, right? Not letting a shaky foundation barely hold on to all of that weight. 
You don't want to see your house wiggling. Same thing. You do not want to see your back, your your hips, everything like that wiggling. And when the people are some some of the people are posting their videos in our uh, our Facebook group, the private Facebook group, and when I see like their legs kind of shaking on the way up, or you'll see literally, you'll see their like back wavering as they're going down and going up. I say, okay, you're going too heavy. Mm -hmm. You need to be able to control this. And part of that's nervous system. But a big part of that is, again, getting comfortable in those deeper ranges. So if you're not focused on mobility, everybody, this has to be this has to be the first 15 minutes minimum of every one of your workouts. And, it and it's crazy if you've never had somebody watch you work out that alone might be a reason to join our 60 day max vertical program. I, I, I try not to, we, we try to limit the sales portions on these mm -hmm. as much as we can. Obviously we have products that we believe in. Um, but that feedback of somebody looking at your workout is huge. Not only if you're a player that's trying to reach, reach new goals. If you're a coach that happens to see your athletes work out, uh, just getting these cues from a coach, from somebody that understands what they're doing, that that feedback alone is invaluable. So mm -hmm. I just want to, I think that that's a really cool aspect that we offer. Okay. So now that we've, ex like, to, the, to a max, we have encouraged injury-free mm -hmm. range of motion and mobility. And this is what we do in our camps as well. Uh, I know that we got commentary that our warmups were too long dur during some of our camps. And I said, we have a responsibility as coaches to keep our players' bodies healthy so that whatever we give them in terms of technique ball control, they're able to do it again with consistency. So when people come to our camps, the reason why we don't get injuries, the reason why we don't have half the camp bowing out uh, by Wednesday or Thursday of an insanely intense week is because we take care of their bodies and we teach them how to take care of their bodies going forward and at home. And the amount of times that we repeat our long warm up means that we're going to ingrain it in them and we're going to give them a gift for life. So ingrained all of that. And we've kept you guys healthy and you know that you should pride yourself on technique and quality of movement before you ever tell me about a number you know i would rather hear you say oh yeah i can i can squat ass to grass with 100 pounds i i would be so much more impressed with seeing that than i would seeing you go six inches down with 315 on your back that means nothing to me nothing so um now let's talk about just some rep and set ranges Right, where you want to be when you're developing max strength, because speed and maximum strength are everything. We talked a little bit about hypertrophy, but that's not really important or good for volleyball players. Some of some of us are going to be able to have to put on some weight. You're going to have to increase your calories, and you're going to have to put on some muscle so that you can have some padding, can have the ability to have extra strength, but. After that, after you're done with your 10 and 12, three sets of 10 to 12 reps, now we got to move on to developing strength. And true, true strength comes in with the three to six sets, somewhere between the and one to six repetitions. Super low reps with higher weight. Again, 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 again. You cannot go to that higher weight until you have found your range of motion but when you're doing this what there are a few things that you want to do because you have to train your body to develop maximum force which is maximum strength and then you also have to be able to train it to do it fast and here's what i used to do and here's what i used to think about when i was fast i used to get under a load weight and then i would kind of jerk my body into something and now as soon as you do that jerky movement when you go up instead of just a fast clean movement you're throwing all of, again, your spine out of line a little bit, and you might shift the weight forward or backwards, and that gets dangerous too. So you have to be able to hold that perfect technique, hold your upper body, don't throw your neck, don't throw your shoulders, and just rise with your spine in the position that it's in. So those are gonna be your base lifts. And base lifts, we're talking about squats, we're talking about deadlifts or Romanian deadlifts, um, and, 
I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend going with a huge one rep max for something like lunges, lunges or by sorry, unilateral exercises where you use one leg or the other. Those are great just for keeping your balance to making sure that both legs are operating in the same way. So those you can, I'm not going to say you can do whatever reps you want, but those are not as important as your uh, three to six sets of one to six repetitions. And when you do these, you have to get used as somebody who wants to jump or sprint. You must get used to taking long rests. And rests are two to five minutes, anywhere from two to five minutes. That means you're sitting there, you are not out of breath, you're chilling, you're checking your cell phone, <laughs> you're joking with the other guys in the, in the weight room, other guys and girls in the weight room. You need to develop that rest so that your body can make short bursts like it will on a volleyball court. So when you're developing that max strength, three to six sets, one to six repetitions, and that's going to be max effort. Now, max effort doesn't always mean max weight. It can mean max speed. And mm -hmm. the, the ability to combine the strength and the speed are what's going to translate directly to a vertical leap. So allow yourself, everybody, to not be out of breath in between your workouts and to take those long rests. Okay. And is that, that's just for the portion that you were just speaking of, right? Because that changes in different cycles, right? Yeah. Like if we're trying to increase our speed or if we're trying to increase our strength, then th those numbers would change. Yeah, they would. So you can do speed strength and speed strength would be taking a much lighter weight. We're talking like 40% of your one rep max or less or just body weight and just seeing how fast you can move. That's basically saying how fast you can move is just like saying how high can you jump, right? Going for that maximum effort. And you can also do that with some kind of modality, not a modality, um, some object like a medicine ball or holding on to something or just adding a light weight vest and moving mm -hmm. a little bit of weight much quicker, right? That's speed strength. And then when we're talking about max strength, then you have to put on some heavier weight. And that weight that you're talking about is now uh, between... 85 and 95 percent of your one rep max those okay. are going to be where you're looking so if you can if the most you can do comfortably with good range and good technique is 100 pounds then when you're training for maximum strength you're getting just four or five reps right that's when you should be at about 85 pounds if you're a 100 one rep max okay um, and I think one of the questions that I could see a lot of people having would be, how, how long do you stay in these cycles? You know, if you're, if you're gearing up towards season, um, trying to get that vertical up to be the highest possible, uh, probably right before your first big tournament or something that you want, mm -hmm. um, how long would you suggest, without giving a game plan or any type of program, how, how long would you estimate you stay in each one of those cycles? Sure. Since so we work uh, the 60 day max vertical works in a 60 day routine. So it's approximately 10 weeks, right? Two of those weeks are really just about fixing your imbalances. The first week is all about just introducing your body. So we're going to say that after that first week, or after the first time you do a workout, you never really need to go back to that complete rehab and rest phase, but you, you can leave it in there. And so the next nine weeks, we spend uh, two weeks in hypertrophy, which is, you know, eight to 12. And what exactly does that mean? Growing your muscles, okay. choosing a weight and set number that will help your muscles grow uh, as opposed to just strengthening them. And now keep in mind that any workout that you do is going to increase your muscle size, the density of your muscles and, and your muscle fiber recruitment. But um, there's a specific, this is why like, bodybuilders work out way different than Olympic lifters and they look completely different, right? That's basketball and volleyball players will work out way differently than football players will because we don't focus on size for a while. If you're a football player, you need to consistently fluctuate between uh, hypertrophy, building your muscle up so that you've got a lot of extra padding and a lot of extra mass and maximum strength and speed. 
as a volleyball player, we don't want to spend a ton of time building more mass. We would just rather be fast and super strong. Right. Cool. So uh, that's, that's what we mean when we're talking about those things. Um, and I would say that if we're, if we're working in a 10 week cycle, you probably want to spend six weeks of that in your max strength um, undulating with, with your speed phase. There's a lot of different ways to do it, but the way that we do it is uh, we have a short period of time in the prehab rehab phase where you're working on your imbalances. That'll last two weeks. Then we spend two weeks in hypertrophy, so that's four weeks. And then we spend four weeks after that, we spend four weeks developing all of your maximum strength. And for the last three, so I know that turns into 11, but for the last three weeks, we also start incorporating a ton of speed. How fast can you move things with that focus? And as a vertical jump person who is training for your vertical jump, technically you should always be focusing on speed. So when you are going up, when you're lifting a weight, when you're squatting, how fast can you move each concentric rep? That's not down, right? We were working on it the other day where mm -hmm. you were dropping out, you were bottoming out, and then you were coming up slower than you were going down. Your goal should be to control on the way down and see if you can fire as fast as you can on the way up. It might not always look like you're moving it fast, but the effort to move it fast means that you're going to recruit more muscles, more motor neurons to be able to develop that and develop the pathways that we talk about for vertical jump. Yeah. And it just, it just makes the workout so much harder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Weird, right? Yeah. Weird. Uh, I hate when workouts yeah, I, are hard. Mainly because I, I don't think I, unless you have, unless you're paying someone to write a program for you or something like that, I, I, it's, it's always hard to find that answer. Um, how, how much do you spend on this? How much do you spend on this, these types of phases? So I think having, having that little, just simple idea is, is pretty big. And I know with, with our program, I had already us moving into, cause we, we just went from last week where we were doing 12 reps. So we're in that kind of higher, higher rep phase. Mm -hmm. And now this week we've dropped down to eight. And obviously, when you drop down to that eight, the speed gets a little bit quicker. You you feel like you're moving it a little bit more, and then you're able to handle a little bit more weight. So, uh, you're you're feeling the increases already in the strength and speed, which makes you feel like you're progressing, which is big. You know, it's it's yeah. it's always tough to do a workout where you you don't really know how if you're getting stronger. You know, it's mm -hmm. just, you're just trusting the trainer or somebody and saying, yeah, it, it'll come, it'll come. And this is, I mean, so before we move on from anything from there, everyone has to remember that you are working from the beginning of the program. You're working off of what your one rep max is then, and you are not changing those percentages. You're not changing your one rep max during the program because we have a 10 week cycle. And at the mm. end of those 10 weeks, that's when you're retesting. That's when you reset the numbers. You should be able at the end of 10 weeks to jump higher, to lift more than you did on week zero. But you shouldn't be playing with those percentages because if you're, if you're not paying attention to them, then you can't, you can't work out intelligently and safely. And then you also never see that improve, and you're, you'll also gas yourself out. You know, you get too tired, you get too sore uh, if, if you're not doing that uh, percentage-based program. And I, I love the percentage-based programs. Uh, not everybody does it. Some people do it a little bit more by body feel. But percentage-based program keeps you accountable for not going, not overreaching. And I will say to everyone this. If there is a number that you are somewhere sliding between, like you only have 10 pound weights instead of five pounds or 2.5 pounds, choose the lower number. Choose the lower number that you think you're in between and the consistency that you'll be able to have, the longevity of your workouts, of your body, of staying injury free, that 
will be huge for your overall improvement because again you'll never have to take that four six eight week break because of injury which will obliterate everything that you've worked for so why put it at risk Mm -hmm. for for, for one squat at a higher number that comment about not changing your percentages that's something that i've never really thought of because you know you get stronger and you're like oh i'm stronger now i'll do more weight um but sticking to it, sticking to your plan, trusting the process that I learned something just now. So mm-hmm. <laughs> good job. <laughs> nice. Thanks, man. Um, when, when you say mechanics, are you talking about just what people should look like while they're doing their jump, whether it's a block or a or an approach? Are you going to focus more on approach? Or let's what talk are you a little bit of, uh, let's, let's go for a little bit more approach mechanics okay. uh, and doing doing an approach jump. The basic block jump is a little bit easier. There's a lot less involved. You're going down so long as you have good mobility and you spring up. And the faster you go down and spring up, the higher you jump. Uh, there's, of course, there is some a little bit more to that, but uh, the approach mechanics are huge. So approach mechanics, there is a lot that we need to talk about with the last three steps of your approach. Uh, We teach a four-step approach, and it's the small right, slightly bigger left step. And this is where it gets very important. From the left to the right left for those last three steps. Now, as an indoor player, there's going to be a slight foot turn. There's going to be what's called a block step that happens in front of you. And that's where you end up turning your foot sideways. If you're running at the net, your foot would kind of turn sideways on the last step towards your setter. As a beach player, that's going to be different because we have less of an opportunity to pull that hockey stop where our momentum immediately stops and then goes upright. So we need that last foot ankle turn on the last step of our approach in indoor. But if you're playing beach, leave your toes in the direction that they're facing. You don't really need that. So you're gonna get a lot more kind of quadricep recruitment uh, from from the beach jump. Now, when you go from your left to your right left, importantly, what you have to remember is that you want to extend that stride So your left to your right left should fire. Imagine racing or trying to go as far and as fast as you can with one single step. That is a good way to think about extending your left to your right left or your left to your step close. You want that foot to fire off. And for some people, I've helped them by say, actually like, claw like use your toes to claw behind you so that you're actually pressing off of it some people just kind of step i'll say daintily from their left to their right left without developing fast forward motion when you develop that fast forward motion you're increasing the tension that's about to uh, be put on your on your leg muscles and that increased tension that increased force allows you to jump higher So from your left to your right left, extend that left step, drive forward with your right heel, and then leave both toes pointed forward if you're in the sand and pop off of that ground hard, okay? So extend the left step is key, extend the left step. All right, when you're driving into the last two steps, your right foot is going to hit heel first and then toe. So your right foot is going to almost kind of roll on the ground from heel to toe, and your left foot is going to stomp. And essentially, it'll stomp with the base of the ball of your foot. I know that's kind of, it may be tough to visualize if we're just looking at it, but if you think midfoot or the base of the ball of your foot, that'll be good. You don't want to jump off your toes. You do not want to stab your toes into the sand. That will cause you to break, slow down, and all of the energy that should be being loaded into your quadriceps um, and then glutes is then going to be dissipated through like your toes and ankles. And we don't want that slowdown to happen. So for everybody out there, big left step in super slow motion, roll heel to toe on your right, 
and mash the ground hard and quick with the middle of your left foot. And that's a good way to think about those last three steps. So it's, it sounds like when, when we're doing that jump, a lot of it is going to be coming from a lot of our vertical is going to be coming from that left leg. If, if we're kind of pounding that, that left, left, left foot into the ground where you're finding the ball of your foot, um, is that kind of accurate? Cause for me, you know, you, you try to, you try to jump evenly. Um, but it is common, especially if I'm playing a tournament for my left quad to be more sore than my right. Um, and so I, I guess that that kind of explains that a little bit. Yeah, there's a ton of, so the, your right leg essentially loads on a slower stretch. So in reality, your right leg is, it, it's got an easier job because it slows you down mm -hmm. a little bit more slowly than your left and your left absolutely hits and it completely finishes the stop of your forward momentum right or we could say that it just translates it up mm -hmm. right and and both of those both of those legs will go up but uh your right leg takes a little bit longer to slow you down because your your right leg's almost going to be almost fully extended when your heel strikes right when your heel strikes at ground that right leg is going to be pretty extended and then you're going to slowly bend it as your hips start shifting forward and then your left foot just basically stomps on the brakes and that's what sends you up um and now you're not jumping just off of your left foot that left foot is just the exclamation point on the end of it that sends you upright i like that i like the way you put that um so a, a lot of times when i'm seeing I, th I feel like I see this more on the women's side than I do the men, um, mm. but almost this little hop into their last two steps. Do you know what I'm talking about? So like instead of this big reach that we're talking about that you did after your between your third step and your last two closing steps or last two explosive steps. Instead, it almost looks like when they're putting down, they put down that right step as a timing step. They've gone on to their left as their second step. And then it almost looks like they jump over a hurdle into a jump. Somebody who I famously know does this that is pretty good is April Ross. Um, she's kind of good. Yeah, she's okay. Um, no, she's amazing. And that's like, but when I was coaching, when I was coaching younger kids, I I told them this, and, and it did increase their. It looked like it increased their stability a little bit on their jump. Um, mm -hmm. But do you have any kind of? thoughts on that like because it sounds a little different from the style you just explained now i'm not going to say that april ross ruined beach volleyball <laughs> <laughs> please don't but the, please don't say that <laughs> but the way the way she jumps makes it a little bit harder to to coach her because she's so fantastic and she has a pretty unique jump i call it, i call it basically like a puddle stomp right mm -hmm. where she is jumping in there and there's a few things that we really have to pay attention to when we see that and when we're teaching it one of them that's really important is hip level so a lot of coaches will teach this left to right left and they'll say okay now jump up and then stop on your last two right that what that does is that slows your horizontal speed mm -hmm. so you have to be more under the ball earlier if you're going to do that puddle stomp but uh, what what really happens the biggest problem is when people jump up off of their left foot instead of forward instead of driving forward they end up landing on their last two steps with straighter legs and then they have to continue that sink down and then go up. So your last two steps end up actually being slower. And a mm -hmm. vertical jump is a combination of speed, how fast can you get off the ground, uh, and strength. So if you're in contact with the ground and then your hips are sinking and then you go up, you're actually going to have less of a vertical jump because you're not telling your, your legs to jump as high as they possibly can. That is why when you jump from a approach jump, you jump higher than you do on a block jump because dropping down with your hips from a tall position is slower 
than driving forward and stopping yourself, right? That combination of speed, you might have the same strength, but since you've developed and forced more speed out of your approach in the approach jump, that's what jumps helps you jump higher. So we don't want to do this hop between. What April does is if you watch her hip level, if you put her approach and you're looking like from the side of her, and this is really tough to see if you're watching YouTube videos or whatever, but if you see a level version of the side of her, you will see that her hips actually stay along the same plane and her knees drive up so that by the time she's actually in contact with the sand, she's already loaded with her hips back and her knees bent. So she's still hitting the ground really fast and from a deeper position. And that's what helps her jump high. But if we teach this kind of big, tall puddle hop and, and people don't keep their knees bent or they don't wait to ground contact with their butt back or they hit the ground, then they bend their legs, then they come up, that's when we have a big problem in terms of getting the maximum out of your vertical. So it's, it's kind of a dangerous technique. I'm not going to say dangerous health-wise, but it's a dangerous technique to teach because people can get it wrong really quickly. Mm -hmm. If your hip level changes between your left and your right left, you're not going to be able to get off the ground as fast. And when you're not able to get off the ground as fast, you're not able to jump as high. Right. It, it sounds like it's it has it has more to do with April Ross just being a very physical as well. You know, her being able to do that hop that puddle hop approach, but also maintain all the strength that she needs and, and, uh, and find that torso tilt, uh, that allows her to spring up. Uh, she's finding it during that puddle hop, which a lot of people I think would stand up and that's what I see. And then they land and then they dip and then they go up and, and try to create exactly. the, create the approach. So, um, that, that was something that I was kind of thinking about was finding that, that, torso tilt mm. or f leaning forward so um that's something that i i've tried to focus on because i tend to be a, a very up and down jumper um but if i tend if i'm focusing on my approach and i am able to find this torso tilt meaning that my upper body is like 45 degrees from the ground mm -hmm. then that can help me with my vertical as well and it sounds like that's what april ross has found a way to do that during her during that puddle hop, whereas some of us don't even have the ability to do it while we're approaching, um, which that alone is impressive. But do, do you want to talk anything about like upper body and how using your upper body and torso to increase that vertical as well? Yeah, um, because it's 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 a piece that's uh, it's another thing that's misunderstood about vertical jump because people when they see when you tell them to throw their arms back and i don't think we're gonna have time today to talk about arms so we, we might end up coming back to this in a future episode guys if you're in the comments and you want us to talk more about this go ahead if you want to really dive into a longer article it's called the the 10 commandments of the vertical jump i think we have that on our on our blog so just go ahead and betterbeach.com forward slash blog and then search for vertical jump and you'll you'll be able to get a lot of information out of that now people think that your because your arms throw back that your torso should tilt forward more what should happen is that you're just getting into that squat position right when you squat your chest isn't completely upright it it your your chest does lean forward slightly as your hips drop back so that you're getting into that squat position if you kept your hips to if you kept your chest or your shoulders directly over your hips as soon as you went to squat you would just fall backwards right the pendulum isn't there mm -hmm. so this being able to get into that squat whatever position you're in when you're in a good squat when you're underweight that's the position that you should jump from that's your power position so if you have good squat technique then at some point when you're looking at yourself jump in the sand especially it's going to be slightly different because of that block step indoor right but in the sand that's the same tilt that you should have from your torso you shouldn't get your we'll say you shouldn't get your chest or your nipples like facing the ground 
before you jump, your chest, your spine should still be stacked with a slight lean forward and your arms swing back and move around that. Don't let yourself throw your arms back and make your chest go forward to throw your arms back. A great exercise that we teach is just sitting in that squat position. Don't let your torso move. Don't let your hips move, but just throw your hands back, right? Without letting that tilt. People are going to feel a big stretch sensation in their chest when this happens. But if you throw your hands back and you never feel that pingy stretch sensation in your pecs, then you're you're probably leaning too far forward. And what you're going to do then is you're going to be using a lot of low back strength instead of the strength from your glutes, hamstrings, and quads. So I like that. Yeah, it would be essentially what needs to happen is your center of mass, your center of gravity needs to be directly over your midfoot or transitioning over your midfoot when you start going concentric. In other words, when you start going up. But like we learned when we were talking about squatting earlier, if you lean forward because you push your butt back, now that center of gravity is over your feet. And your center of gravity, when you start going up in your jump, it needs to be sliding from behind into, okay, now it's directly over my midfoot, so now I'm jumping. Instead of when I stop, all of like if I'm tilting forward or I'm leaning my shoulders forward, now my center of gravity is over my feet, so now I'm just kind of pulling. I've, I've skipped over that, and I can't jump up. This is all very difficult to show without a bunch of jump uh, analysis mm -hmm. going on, and um, it, it does get easier on our private Facebook group when we can see people taking their approaches and we analyze those and we break them down it's, it's way easier for us to coach everybody individually where they can see this but this is a great head start to saying the most common myths and mm -hmm. should i lean forward should i throw my head and chest forward no you want upright and you want your arms to go back without throwing your chest forward right um should my toes stab into the ground no roll the heel slap the left should i do that big puddle stomp from my left to right left no it's kind of a good cue to start people thinking about getting their last two steps to happen quick mm -hmm. but you need to ditch that quickly so that people aren't landing in a high position then squatting and then jumping because again there's no point in taking an approach then at that point you're just literally stepping into a block jump which is a lower jump yeah, it's it, it kind of I think that that's a really great stopping point for us because it kind of brings everything full circle and showing how much importance it is of you finding the proper mobility and strength in your body and balance. Because when I was explaining how I use my torso tilt, it made me think about it for a second. It's like I don't I haven't even found that when I'm squatting yet. <laughs> you know, and, mm -hmm. and now I'm trying, I'm trying to play around with it on the beach and I, and I feel it, you know, I can, I, it's something that I can concentrate on, but as I find that balance and that strength through my squat, I can almost guarantee you that I'm going to find that balance and strength with my jump as well. Um, mm -hmm. and you can't do one without the other. So I think that that's kind of a, a great full circle moment where, uh, it kind of puts everything together. Definitely. Guys, if you uh, want to support the show and you want to get some of our cool swag that we've just got up there, you can go to betterbeach.com forward slash shop and you'll be able to see shirts, hoodies, uh, tank tops, and a bunch of our cool designs. If you want us to coach you on your vertical jump technique, uh, your lifting, or just your game in general, where you get to post your videos, you get to ask your questions in our private Facebook group and meet with us twice a week, uh, then you go to betterbeach.com forward slash coaching and you get to sign up for a full year where you get all of our courses and you get two meetings a week that are all recorded and uploaded to your library, whether you come live or not. And you get to post all of your technique videos and all of the drills that we give you so that you can improve your game quickly. Finally, uh, if you want to improve your vertical jump, you go to betterbeach.com 
and you go to that home page and you will be able to see the vertical jump program you just click right there and you can get that as a standalone course on your own so you don't necessarily have to jump into our full coaching program it just helps to have somebody coaching you on your technique but if you just want the 60 day max vertical program recorded all set out for you it comes with a nutrition tracker it comes with energy assessments energy assessments it comes with all of your sheets required for tracking your workouts it's right there for you and i know that our camp in april is sold out sorry everybody but we do have upcoming clinics. We just got word that we're going to go to Huntsville, Alabama, as soon as we know if the AVP schedule coordinates with us. We're also going to New York. Uh, we have a private event in Santa Monica, which no one's invited to except for those people. Uh, but we also have Salt Lake City, Ozark, and San Francisco this weekend. I'm so fired up for San Francisco. We have close to 60 people there for seven and a half hours training. I know. And it's been it's been a while too because we, we've been talking to the guys who kind of organize that area up there and I feel like we've been trying to get up there since before the pandemic hit. So uh, I'm just, I, and I love that area. We have a lot of followers. So I'm excited to get up there, see everybody and, and hopefully bring some some new learnings to the coaches and players in that area. It's really cool. And I, I think that that's something that's really cool to talk about too. So one of the big things with San Francisco is not only do they have a phenomenal group of people that want to come, but one of the big reasons that they want us to come up there as well is because they have a lot of coaches that are not as experienced as they would like, that have a passion for it, and they want their coaches to be able to coach better. So that was one of the main reasons that we wanted to go up there. So it doesn't, you don't necessarily have to have a huge group of people if you have people that want to get better whether they're coaches or players like those those are the events that really hype us up and get us going because that's that's why we're here mm -hmm. all right well we'll get into our q a all right okay uh i'll just start at the bottom i like starting at the top because then the bottom but they're they, they ask their question you have to go first. in reverse all right Maybe I'm seeing different. first question by VB Sand. Can we just lower the net? Oh, Great that's option. the top to me. All right, cool. Okay. Can we... yeah. <laughs> yes, so, VB Sand, you uh, can VB lower Sand, the net. You can. How are we going to beat Brazil on a high net? Um, <laughs> Italy, that's cool. Australia, wow, we got some worldwide listeners today. That's pretty cool. What's up, Bernardo? I'm trying to go on. Anthony Men's, Santos. wow, Men's Beach National Team, Guam. I wake up for the gym, make my smoothie right in life. I do my morning routine and hit the gym. Love it. Glad we can add a little spice into your uh, into your morning, Anthony. And if you need help, we've uh, who wh who did uh, did you work with someone from Chile? Chile? Uh, the Philippines. Philippines. That's what it was. Yep. Um, so Anthony, if you're if you're looking for some help, we've already gone down the road of helping somebody. Get on their national team. Accomplish a pretty good, pretty good goal of getting on their national team. So we'd love to work with you too, buddy. Um, there's a lot of talk about jump, but I think equally important is the safe landing. I see a whole bunch of people that land on their heels or land with full impact on knees. I hope you guys cover it. That's definitely something that we can cover in the future. Um, mm -hmm. And it is important. I think personally that indoor coaches spend way too much time trying to teach their athletes to jump on to land directly on two feet if you look at all of the world's greatest players the tilt that you need to take off because you are sliding over your left foot so when we talk about that that block step you are sliding over your left foot which means your left side will come down first because that's the last part of your takeoff also because you're reaching, you're tilting your body and reaching up higher with your right hand and bringing that momentum, you're going to end up slightly tilted, which means you're going to land on one foot. And it's okay to land on one foot. Every sprint that you do is landing with something like eight times your body weight on one leg. Your body is designed to handle these forces right? You have to balance that out in your training and you have to strengthen it. But remember that you're not landing on one foot. One foot is touching the ground and absorbing it slowly. And then the right foot is coming down. 
Should you land on your heels? Definitely not. Should you land on straight legs? Definitely not. But that long slowdown that happens when one foot comes down and then the other, that is okay. So long as you're developing the strength and stability in the weight room to be able to handle that. And all of the world's elite jumpers land with one foot before the other. It happens. So mm -hmm. it's okay. And there needs to be less stress about that and more focus on just developing the strength than necessarily the landing technique because the landing technique won't it it just won't stick in with volleyball players to land on two feet every single time at the same exact time i like it i know people are gonna fire in those comments right now yeah that's a, um okay <laughs> um and, and it's tough, too, because a lot of times, obviously, in indoor, it, it is a huge thing. And, it, and in beach, it is, too. But with the soft sand and stuff like that, I think a lot of people do uh, miss over it or skip over it. So um, definitely something to think about for the future. Okay. The takeaway for me from this Reed Hall, from this and Reed Hall and others, is making sure my players have a good foundation in mobility and overall strength and flexibility. Mark? Nail on the head. <laughs> what are some of the best some of the best body weight exercises that I can tell my players to do at home? They have little to no equipment. That's a really good question. I like that one a yeah. lot. For vertical jump, number one, take a kitchen chair, take one leg off of the ground, sit back into that kitchen chair with one leg nice and slow. And so that means don't just plop down into it but control, control until you touch that leg and then fire up. If you can do that with control, in other words, your leg's not wiggling on the way down and you're not getting all off balance, but you can control, keep a nice uh, upright spine and then fire up, that is a good one-legged squat. Another one that you can do is you turn and you put that chair behind you. You put your toes of one foot on top of that chair and this is another version of a one-legged squat it's a bulgarian squat so it's a single leg squat if you let your knee then go down to touch the ground with your back foot elevated boom you fire up with one leg and this is how we tell our 60-day max vertical people uh, who don't have all of the equipment or they're quarantined or whatever if you don't have the weights okay we show you how to modify each exercise so that you can do this but those one-legged lunges uh, one-legged uh, chair squats and one-legged Bulgarian squats, those are massive. So long as you control down and then you fire fast on the way up, you can get a ton done with just that one-legged stuff. I like it. All right. On court, speed and the transfer of energy from the speed seems to be king. How do you balance still transferring energy efficiently and the slower, more up and down approach that we use in sand i think you kind of covered that in the in the conversation but yeah still still keep that speed you're just not going to do that hockey stop so you're definitely not going to be moving as fast forward on the beach as you will in indoor because you're going to end up exploding that sand right and we also don't want that block foot to turn sideways in the sand as much as it does indoor so we're you're not going slow in the beach remember that the last three steps are firing left to right left needs to absolutely fire but you're just not going to carry that same speed momentum that you do in indoor okay um i'm going to see a trainer fix those hip flexors mark we're rooting for you if you need some help we have our seven day mobility that alone can build up those those hips i know for me specifically one of my biggest issues is my tight, hit, tight hips, and with our warm-up and that seven-day mobility and our strength work, uh, it's already doing wonders for my hips. So feel free to reach out to us as well. Yeah, Mark, Finishing. sit here and listen to us for an hour for free, and then you go see some trainer who got a certification <laughs> in four weeks online. <laughs> we are better at beach. Jesus. Um, finishing the warm-up made me feel like I could do anything that day. Oh, Timmy. My guy, Tim Cruz, coming back I to see us Tim. in April. Yeah. I can't wait to see him again. Bro, I'll work for free. Yeah. So this <laughs> is Jean-Luc, who has his contacted us a number of times, and he said that he like wants to come out in California and, and be doing things for free and uh, just get a bunch of volleyball experience. He's going about it the right way, just waiting for I him like to show it. up. Same way yeah. he did. Get here. Um, 
I have a question about the video topic. What are the difference between indoor and beach blocking vertical jump and how important is a jump and blocking or more important is timing? Um, that's a loaded That's question. a very loaded question. Um, very quickly, in indoor, we see a lot of swing, swing blocking, which means that you're kind of, it's almost the same as an approach. Um, you're doing a little approach to get to that position to the outside. Um, with beach, it's very, very up and down. You're fronting your attacker, so it's a straight vertical. Um, so I like what you said about timing, uh, Martins. Um, I think that beach blocking is a lot more based on timing and that explosive drop to that quick up like Mark was talking about, um, whereas an indoor, you're going to be using that approach and find the rhythm, and then that's going to allow that vertical. But um, definitely two different types of jumps. Okay. Man, if if higher level beach blockers would start training indoor blockers and especially middle blockers, middle blockers, what they're becoming on the world tour, like in the world league for indoor. Mm -hmm. are becoming what beach blockers should be when you see them throw their hands up and then left or they'll split their hands super wide or they'll let a middle pass them and then go attack that zone with their hands mm -hmm. i think the world league middle blockers and what beach blockers should be are starting to, to match up and uh those games that people play with their hands if if some indoor national team started getting a little bit of training from some high level beach blockers i would be super impressed to see i'd be interested to see what happens even though you do want to be a little bit more stable in indoor and let your defense take care of the rest but when you get to the world league i mean you're not digging these rockets like you have to get some blocks right so i want to see some more flowy hands happening on indoor that that we get <laughs> in the beach I like that. That's how you always got me in practice. Except for that tool to the line. Got me good. If you ever went at my right hand, <laughs> score. <You> try <laughs> my left hand. That, that one's fine. One, two more questions. Um, in my early 60s, realistically, how could I strive to jump? Get mobility first. Yeah. Mark, I see. I think... Uh, the first thing that I'm going to say, and this this has been a conversation that I've been having with Mateo at our camps, who is just an awesome individual. I think he's how how old did do we think Mateo is? Ninety seven. Yeah, in his nineties. <laughs> I hope he's well. um, no. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure how old he is, but one of the things that he talks about <clears throat> it it doesn't always have to be how high are you going to jump. Um. I think now you're at the point where you're trying to figure out how long you can play this game. And that is that question is completely based on your answer. And the, the answer that you need to feel is that this mobility that we're talking about, the strength that you can have um, for you, Mark, it might not be so that you can get a 35, 40 inch vertical for you. It might be so that you just feel a little bit stronger while you're playing. Um, and, and that mobility is key as we get older. We, we see it with your parents, your grandparents. Currently, just seeing them get out of chairs looks difficult, but that's, that can be fixed. So I think it's just an, it's an ability now. If you're an older player, the mobility and strength is probably more important for you so that you don't get injured so that you can keep playing this game that you fell in love with to play at a point where you are 60. Um, you're lucky to be playing a sport. <laughs> um, so I, I think it's something that as long as you keep working on that mobility, don't worry about the, the, how high you're jumping. It's more just feeling safe when you're out there. Mm -hmm. Uh, right. We did get one question for a, a workout suggestion. So I know that this doesn't always appear, but if you guys search exactly for this, beach volleyball, plyo, agility, and conditioning. Beach volleyball, plyo, agility, and conditioning. Um, if you check that out on YouTube, one more time, beach volleyball, plyo, agility, and conditioning workout, uh, you will be able to find this video. I'll also include 
if uh, you know i don't know if it worked like um for those of those who are here's just a quick and easy workout that you can do on the beach uh, i think it requires no equipment so check it out it's one of our other youtube videos i love it i think that's about all we got time for today mm -hmm. high five man that was a good episode and i think we yeah. could have gone another couple hours i mean the mechanics of vertical vertical jump especially with approach jumping and everything and mm -hmm. working out the right way to be able to develop that and getting people to stop running long distances and biking and rowing for however many meters all of this needs to be converted into short sprints if you want to run a mile do it in eight second max sprints with a one minute rest and that will be so much better for you for vertical jump and for playing volleyball than any long extended slow jog or slow cardio couldn't agree more all right till next time i'll see you at practice Bryn. i'll see you in a little bit Later. thanks for tuning in guys appreciate y'all and we'll see you next week Bye bye